Welcome to the KDevOps talk. My name is Lewis Chamberlain, and I'm a file systems engineer at uh, SUSE Labs. The KDevOps project is a it's an open source project which tries to allow you to um, allow you to configure and bring up hosts, and then run Linux kernel development workflows using modern DevOps infrastructure. Now. Um, I'm going to review a few key concepts that I'm, I'll, I'll try to uh, explain so that way we're all on the same page. I'm going to explain uh, the original motivations behind the, this effort. Uh, I'm going to explain the bring up gap that was observed while doing some of this initial development. And then I'm going to explain by command and control and what I mean by that. We're going to review what we have today in KDevOps and what I expect to be coming soon in KDOPS as well. The original motivation here was to reduce the amount of time it takes to stabilize a new Linux file system. Now, I have tried to get a sense for what folks believe it takes to stabilize file system. And it seems um, a lot of people are not aware of how complex this is and how much time it takes. Um, let's review a few key concepts though. What is a baseline though? Baseline, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, but those that are not familiar with file systems testing or testing in general, baseline just consists of uh, your series of uh, known tests that um, pass and fail. Uh, that's your baseline. Uh, and what is a new file system anyway? Well, is ButterFS a new file system, for instance? ButterFS has now been merged uh, 13 years on, on Linux, so is it a new file system? At this point, it's not. Um, taking a random poll on Twitter reveals that most folks think it's a lot easier to stabilize a file system. And um, the amount of effort to also upkeep and stabilize a file system seems easy as well. Um, some companies that are new to Linux also believe that they don't really need to do a lot of work behind stabilizing file systems. Uh, so there is quite a bit of effort required to do this. And uh, I'm going to get into some of these details. So to understand why it takes so long to stabilize a file system, we must divide and conquer. We have to try to understand why it takes so long. And, and we also have to understand that stable doesn't really mean that there are no issues. If you're doing proper testing, you will always have issues to work on. Some of the dangers um, that I've observed as a relatively newcomer to file systems development is that there is little, little to no documentation. It's also difficult then for new developers to ramp up. Testing file systems is complex. That's another lesson that I have learned really quick and jumping into file system development. And I asked myself in trying to analyze this question, uh, what if we at least tried to make file system testing easier? What would this look like and what is needed? For those of you who are not familiar with testing file systems, we use a, a project called XFS tests. Now XFS tests, as the name implies, came, came from uh, the XFS file system and its test suite. These days, we use XFS tests to test different file systems, all file systems as possible. So it's not only used for XFS. Uh, we do a disservice, in my opinion, in the community by calling and referring to XFS tests as XFS tests. So I'll refer to XFS tests as FS tests moving forward, given that it reflects uh, better with the community and what in, in the test framework that we use it for and that we support different file systems for it. For those that are not familiar, here's an example of a configuration file to test different file systems. Here's just your general generic setup. Here you have your configuration options for testing ButterFS in a simple environment. Uh, and here's another example. Uh, the M MKFS options is, uh, is basically what you the test framework we'll use to create the file system that you will test 
And as such, you can also imagine then that you have different KFS options that you likely would want to test. This is pretty time consuming as you can imagine. Um, so the original approach here was to try to at least reduce the complexities around using uh, FS tests. And part of that work was the project called OS Check. It was announced in July 2018 and it essentially consists of a shell wrapper around uh, Hephaestus' own check script. This is why it's called OS check. Um, it splits up testing also, at least for XFS, into sections. As I described earlier, you have different MKFS parameters that you may want to use for different types of features that you want to enable for your file system. One of them may be reflex, for instance. As such, you need to actually test different you know, uh, run different tests on these different uh, configurations, this will also increase the amount of testing that you will have to do. So OS Check's approach was to divide this by uh, the different MKFS params that you create. It assumes that, you know, if you want to reduce the amount of time it takes to test, you will use a different um, bare metal or virtual guest per section that should reduce the amount of time it takes to test, given that you'll be running in parallel different tests, full FS tests per section. Now, one of the things that became clear, though, also, I should mention uh, that it tracks expunges uh, for file systems, given that uh, without the expunges, you won't, uh, you, you'll essentially just crash immediately. Take it for granted that you run FS tests, you will crash the system. And the reason is, that as, as I described earlier, uh, proper testing will ensure that you always have issues to address. Um, expunge lists remove tests that you know are, uh, are going to fail so that way you can track a baseline. Uh, one of the things that became evident after announcing this project was that we we were lacking a way to do bring up. Um, and Matthew Wilcox uh, originally had brought this up. And his recommendation was actually to merge K-Test and OS Check together. Uh, I looked into that, and I ended up disagreeing with that. Um, and I, I really disliked both um, my own script approach and even K-Test script approach uh, in the sense that we were forcing everyone, shoving Kimi down everyone's throat. I'm not sure that's the best idea. It also assumes that you're running Linux, and these days we even have kernel developers doing Op, uh, Linux kernel development on other operating systems. Um, it also assumes that you're going to be using local virtualized Asian technologies, and that's not also true. You may want to use uh, cloud solutions. So the bring up gap is this. How do we bring up hosts to do kernel development, and specifically for FS tests? So everyone does have their own set of uh, scripts for running test with Kimio, for instance. K-Test is one, Rapido is another one. I had my own KVM tests. Folks run different operating systems. You may run Linux, you may run OS, OS X, you may be even hacking on Linux on Windows these days. And as I described earlier, you may have a preference for KVM, you may have a preference for VirtualBox. Um, in the file systems world, there was one cloud solution available only, and that was uh, Ted chose uh, uh, Festus BLD project. Um, and the only problem with that I found with that was that it's completely based on Google Cloud Compute. That's obvious because he works for, for Google. Uh, but there are other cloud solutions out there. Uh, Azure, AWS, OpenStack, what about those? How do we address those? Um, the command and control design goals here are that I wanted to for bring up to automatically extend and optionally extend your SSH configuration with provision nodes. You optionally also want to maybe add your git config and your favorite bash hacks into the target nodes. You also want to install workflow dependencies. Now I'll get into what workflows are in a bit. You want to run those target workflows on each node and then you want to collect results and show them in a reasonable way. Workflows are essentially what you want to run once you have your host brought up. So that, that's the design goal. So with that in mind, 
that kind of brought together the architecture for key DevOps and split it up into three major components. And I, and I show this diagram and it's part of key DevOps uh, description, given that I think it helps uh, understand what the goals are behind key DevOps. So bring up is just one part of the, the effort here. And that is, as I described earlier, uh, you may just want to skip bring up together. You may already have your host provisioned and your host uh, accessible via SSH, and you already have your host configured on your SSH configuration. You already have access to them. But you may also just want to use KVM VirtualBox or use a different cloud provider. That's that's a uh, bring up. Now, K DevOps configuration. This is as I described. Maybe you want to you know extend your SSH configuration add your git config, your personal bash hacks, and maybe install your favorite, you know, editors like Vim, Emacs, or whatever. Now, workflows are the last component here. That is exactly how you want to use those hosts that you have provisioned. A uh, simple example here is obviously you just want to get clone Linux next. You want to add a few extra patches that you're developing on. You want to configure Linux. You want to actually build Linux, install it, reboot into it, and then run a simple test script, you know, or so. So that's essentially an example of the, the gist of a typical one single solution type of workflow within K DevOps world. Um, in, in doing this work, it became very clear fast that there's a shared effort here um, in doing file systems testing, not Linux kernel development, and let's say running self tests on the Linux kernel, we share the Linux bring up effort. Uh, and as such, there was a value in splitting up the bring up component of uh, my effort here so that it can be shared and can be used by others, not only just for uh, file systems testing. So this is why KDevOps became a separate project. Um, tools used in the end were Vagrant, Terrible, Terraform, Ansible, and the last component that I added was Linux kernel modeling variability language called kconfig, uh, which is what we use in, in, the, in the kernel to configure the kernel. Um, here's a simple example of what you end up with in testing uh, with kdevops for file systems. You simply configure kdevops. After you configure it, you run make depths to install all the dependencies that you may have. You may bring up. This is shared between whether or not you have uh, bare metal, you know, localized you know, uh, virtualization technologies, or you're using cloud solution. This will actually bring up all the hosts after you do the configuration. Make Linux, after you run this make Linux command, you will have all the hosts that you brought up with rebooted into the Linux kernel with the extra patches if you have any already on them. It ensures that you actually have Linux running on them. Make a fast test, in this case, we're getting to the workflow uh, uh, cases. Uh, in this case, we're actually compiling uh, FS tests. And that's pretty much it on the target nodes. Make FS test baseline will actually run uh, FS tests against your uh, target nodes. And it assumes that you have a baseline. If you don't, you'll obviously end up crashing. If you do have a baseline, you'll skip out on running tests which are known to fail. Now, if you want to keep track of what issues were found, I figured a decent way to see what issues are found is just to have have you run git diff. Now, what does this look like? Well, since we're tracking the expunge lists, it simply becomes a diff against the expunge lists. Uh, now, this is what you would do as a developer initially, right? So you would just extend and augment your expunge list with the known issue and failure, which may have crashed the kernel. As a developer, you may then look into the issue, and then you may want to report it upstream. And this is what I did uh, as an example here. Now, I'm using Debian here as a, as a sample distribution, given that it's just easy to work with, it's public, and so forth. And here's an example, um, kernel.org bugzilla entry that I created. You may obviously use your own internal um, a bug tracking system, but this is an example type of workflow for adding and augmenting the expunge list. And this is a real bug, and you can go and look into it. And I believe that this issue is caused by actually low amount of uh, CPU nodes for the actual test. Um, but I haven't looked into it further again. Um, 
And it's an NVMe issue as well, given that. Uh, anyway, the, the details are in the bug, but you can go look into the, into the issue if you want. Um, so some of the lessons learned here are that Vagrant and Terraform um, is under heavy development. And as with Ansible, um, folks do want to stack on a lot of effort into uh, Terraform and Vagrant. I don't think it's correct to keep augmenting Terraform or Vagrant to doing to doing more than anything but just simple bring up. Um, I ran into a lot of issues with trying to do that and using either Terraform or Vagrant to, for instance, run some Ansible roles. You want to just split out the tasks and as a secondary step, actually have Ansible do the, the remaining tasks like running a fast test and so forth. So this is why I ended up using different targets after you do the bring up. Um, so as such, my effort on using Terraform and, and Vagrant is very minimal. You just want to do bring up. That's pretty much it. Um, Git subtrees have proven to be exceptionally great. And uh, so much so that I actually believe that it can be used uh, as a as a as a tool for us later in kernel development um, to share components of the kernel with other projects. One example I think here that um, deserves some attention is how we use kconfig in different projects. But every time you embrace kconfig, you end up forking kconfig. We don't really need this. Uh, one of the ways that we can address this is by having kconfig be part of its own tree and then having different projects embrace it as a git subtree. A perfect example here is how I ended up using git subtrees to share the SSH uh, Python script to update your SSH configuration between Vagrant and Terraform. So if you want to look into that, you can look in, into the Ansible role that I use for Vagrant for that and also the Terraform module. Um, other lessons are that we have to keep in mind that we want to also test the K DevOps as well. And this means that we want to address testing the framework that we're using for continuous integration. It is a bit more complex though if we want to start doing full testing on everything that the K config supports. For instance, what would it mean and how are we going to do continuous continuous integration uh, for localized virtualization solutions? You know, I don't think GitLab or GitHub, you know, lets you spawn. KVM guests, for instance. So this will require a bit more of uh, tweaking unless we have uh, partnerships with different cloud providers, for instance. And I do think that that, that is possible. Um, Kconfig uh, saved the day. Um, I cannot stress this enough. Um, Kconfig really helped to um, solve, it's helped solve a lot of architectural design uh, conundrums that I ran into. Um, I'll go into some of these in a bit. Um, and Ansible helps to slowly parallelize unparallelized uh, frameworks. Um, an example of this is just how uh, Ansible already has uh, parallelization in, heavily in mind. And as such, it's up to you really to, to design your workflows to try to see what you can parallelize. Um, so going into how kconfig helped, um, it has, bring up has high level of variability, right? You want to, may want to bring up KVM host, uh, virtual box host, uh, cloud solutions, and then how you want to test things, right? Obviously that's uh, highly configurable. Um, in my experience with, uh, embracing kconfig in this project, it, it also helped push to document and describe different distribution bring up concepts. An example here is, um, Different enterprise Linux distributions may obviously have registration schemes. Uh, otherwise, your uh, uh, Vagrant image, images would be uh, completely useless. Uh, another example here is that internal R&D setups may actually want to use uh, custom repositories instead of uh, doing distribution or registration. Well, you actually end up having to document this if you want to add this into kconfig somehow. Uh, and the internal uh, I mean, the actual extensions to add this into kconfig means that you're going to do be documenting this into kconfig as well. Now, um, another benefit uh, was that kconfig allowed to unify 
the different workflows that I had in mind in using KDevops. So as I mentioned earlier, we, we can use KDevops to do kernel development. I was thinking of using it for doing uh, self-tests, for instance, for some of the components that I maintain in the kernel. I also was thinking of using it for file systems testing. Well, with uh, KCONFIG, there's no need to have different Git trees for this. We just unify these things and then basically what you have is a different workflow. You have general kernel development, you have file systems testing, or you have self-tests. Uh, you don't really need to fork these out. Now, there are ways in which you may want to use Git subtrees, though, uh, to uh, fork out, for instance, not fork out, but just use Git subtrees for embracing KDevops for your own private uses. Um, now, not all workflows also use KConfig. So an example here is uh, FS tester. FS test is not configurable. You have to use a whole bunch of parameters and so forth. Uh, and so KDevops allows you to kind of mock up what it would look like if you embrace KDevops within a test target workflow like FS test. And th this is proven very useful uh, in the development of uh, KDevops, given that it has also allowed to put a lot of things into documentation which are just tribal knowledge and to, to get an idea of what it looks like just go look at the kconfig entries for xfs and kdevops there's a lot of documentation now for different features and so forth and incompatibilities for features um it also allows you to define semantics for requirements clearly so uh, certain kernels may require different things, right? So um, kconfig is designed to do this. Um, so what's next in the, the this effort with kdevops? Um, so doing your baseline for testing is still uh, very manual and very time consuming. However, it is possible um, to, and it should be possible, to create a baseline for a random new kernel for a file system, provided you have the tests implemented, right? Um, it really should just consist of trying to detect and smoke out errors and, and annotating whenever you run into an issue and reiterating this process, and annotating, extending your expunge list uh, every single time you run into a crash. So that should be possible. So I do see this as a future uh, development effort that can be integrated into KDevOps for FS tests, for instance. Um, we should be able to also do a uh, reverse bisect. Uh, we want to automate this process. Now, what do I mean by this? This uh, An example here is if um, a recent bug, I won't go into the details given that this is public talk, but um, there was a bug that was a block test bug um, that was reported, and uh, it wasn't only myself that I ran into this issue, but other another developer was able to confirm this. Uh, Daniel um, was able to confirm this, and we, after some time, we observed that the issue just went away, but we were not able to confirm what exactly fi fixed the issue. Um, you should be able to do a reverse bisect to try to see which commit actually fixed this. Um, and that's what I mean by a reverse bisect. We should be able to do this. This is a task that is completely automatable. Um, other workflows can be easily added now. Um, KDevOps now has support for FSS. It should be easy for us to augment it to add Linux kernel self-test. I'll be doing this myself, given that I will be using this for testing firmware and other components that I maintain. Uh, block tests should be very trivial to add as well, um, given that block tests is essentially an architectural kind of fork in spirit of FS tests. Um, and block tests is much more easier in design than in requirements than FS tests. So it should be very easy for us to add block tests as well. KUnit as well. Um, now KUnit, um, it has a very different type of test philosophy than running self-tests. However, it's worth mentioning given that 
it's designed to be extremely fast given that you're running user mode Linux. Not all tests should be qualified as a respective K-unit test. However, there should be many tests that do qualify as respective K-unit tests. And as such, I do encourage us to start considering where where we have this area of uh, ability to convert a test from FS test to K-unit tests. Uh, so I do think that that question will come up later as we start becoming more efficient in developing tests and trying to uh, reduce the amount of time uh, it takes to run tests. Um, what I'm observing as well is that we're starting to co commoditize file systems testing with this, these sorts of technologies. Um, and it should allow us to, with a bit of time, easily ask ourselves and evaluate how long it takes to run a fast test against a baseline in a cloud environment and against different cloud solutions. Who's doing a better job and providing features to allow you to do these tests? Now, if you're a big company you and, and you have a very complex uh, heavy loaded storage type of uh, workload environment, you may realize that um, the effort behind FS tests and testing with FS tests may mimic a uh, very complex workload as well. As such, you may be thinking about doing an evaluation of a cloud solution uh, with KDevOps to essentially also consider running some something similar for your own workloads. Um, containers. Um, it was brought up to me uh, that yes, uh, maybe we should use containers for testing. Yes, absolutely. It should be possible to reduce the amount of time it takes to test the file system by also running, for instance, each individual test on a guest in a different container. You obviously do uh, need a lot more memory for this uh, and you may need a lot more storage. Um, however, it should be possible. Um, you will definitely crash the system right away when you initially do this. And this essentially just means that you'll have a lot more bugs reported. However, we welcome this. We, we want to um, push the limits of Linux. We want to test uh, FS tests in as crazy ways as possible. This is essentially how we reproduce all these crazy situations that um, customers may have. Uh, so yes, um, using containers for running a test uh, per container is a desirable goal and it is something that we will look into. Um, I do suspect that that will then reduce the amount of time it takes to test to running the amount of time it takes to run the longest test that you have. That's pretty much it. Uh, how long does it take to run the NFS test, it's uh, just how long, what's the longest amount of time it takes to run your longest test. That's pretty much it. That's what it should come down to. Um, and to give you some perspective, a full FS tests uh, test with nine different sections that we have may take about eight hours, give or take, if you have the resources to actually spawn nine guests and run in parallel all these guests in the same system. So this would be of huge value. Um, and as I indicated earlier, that begs the question then of which test can we flush out into KUnit as well? And not only for FS test, but also for KUnit. Questions? I see why Bonataki is typing, and so is Torsten. How long does it take and build to build and run tests? Well, to build is relatively fast. Um, um, you may want to build the Linux kernel. That's an optional uh, sub workflow, if you will. And by sub workflow, I mean that, as I indicated earlier, um, for instance, block tests and FS tests share the common goal of maybe if you're doing kernel development, 
to compile Linux from a Git tree and apply a patch. But you may not always want to do that. For instance, if you're already testing and booted into a Linux distribution, you already have the, the target kernel that you want to test. You're not compiling uh, Linux. Uh, and as such, you skip that completely. So it depends what you mean by compiling. But for instance, to compile a fast test, it's really fast, it, less than a minute. Um, I typically recommend, um, from my personal experience, I recommend at least using eight vCPUs, uh, eight gigs of RAM. Uh, that'll give you a decent uh, work environment for compiling FS tests and also running tests. Beyond that, you don't really need anything. Eight vCPUs, eight gigs of RAM is all you really need to run FS tests. And the reason is that we're not paralyzing a lot of work. FS tests is serial. Yeah, that means that um, the check script that's used by FSS runs tests serially. And as such, if you really want to parallelize things further, you need to run containers. Um, so eight VCPUs will, will do it. And that compiling will take you about less than a minute. Running the full tests, uh, that'll depend on what section you're testing. Uh, and each section may take about I don't know, maybe two hours, three hours, four hours, so forth. Um, combination of all tests for at least XFS, about eight hours, give or take. How many architectures uh, does the framework currently support at once? Uh, so KDevOps, by design, I had to make this uh, design uh, criteria early, was um, we want to support using kconfig to allow you to specify what architecture you want to use and not to run different tests in parallel. So what I mean by this is if you want to deploy kdevops to test x86, you can do so. If you want to use X kdevops to test ARM64, you can do so, but it'll be in different directories. Your configuration just changes. Um, and the spawned guests that you run or your cloud environment that you run, that'll just be separate, you know, that'll be stored in different directories. Um, so pretty much in, in parallel at once, as many as are supported. Today, I only support uh, x86. However, I made it very easy, in my opinion, to add uh, architecture support for uh, other CPUs. So feel free to send a patch if you'd like to, to add that. It should be relatively easy to add support for other architectures. Any other questions? Martin is asking, uh, would it be possible to integrate complex storage setups in the bring up like multi-path? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Um, and to give you an idea, um, my, my goal, uh, since I'm working with FOSS systems, is to also reduce the amount of time it takes to run the tests. Ideally, if you have enough resources, you would actually um, get clone and run everything completely in memory, and you would use tempfs. And this is exactly why the um, um, the way in which FSS is configured with KDevOps is to use loopback devices. So that way, if you have the setup available to run everything in tempfs, then so be it. Um, the additional uh, setup for storage is certainly possible. And this is why uh, it was a different Ansible role made available to allow you to create different partitions and use different devices and you specify the path. So if you want to do that, by all means, you can look into that Ansible role. You can look into how, um, for instance, right now by default, it uses NVMe. Uh, and this is also why for the different cloud providers, I actually looked into all the different cl cloud solutions that, that are available, Azure AWS and everything. And I looked for target default uh, nodes that would typically replicate your storage or Linux file system kernel developer the best desire is to test file systems uh, or storage. Um, so as such, I, I strive to look for um, cloud solutions on 
images, nodes, if you will, that would come with NVMe drives or uh, allow you to use uh, something like a AWS or EBS, uh, which would dynamically allow you to create different drives on the fly. Uh, so yes, you can certainly do that. It's just a matter of um, specifying the path uh, with, within the given Ansible role and augmenting it. In this case for KDevOps, given that it's using the Ansible role to create the partitions, you would only have to extend KDevOps with a KConfig entry to allow it to specify a different uh, multipath or LVM or MD solution and so forth. So th this would be a KConfig integration into KDevOps to use the Ansible role in different ways. And if you may need so, you may need to extend those Ansible roles to support that as well. Any other questions? Okay, so there are no further questions. Oh, Giovanni. Yes, it, take, it takes a long time to click all the Firefox uh, buttons to share the camera. Um, I, I want to say you, you seem very focused in developing this, um, uh, the, the scripts, in developing the, the testing uh, framework. Um, I, I wonder if you see as an uh, equally important uh, aspect of this sort of um, keeping it running with uh, minimal supervision. What I, what I want to say is that it, we in the performance team, we, 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 um, the effort is mostly done by, by, by mail, by mail government, but uh, we, uh, the hours of engineering have been spent in writing the, the, the framework, but there's also a lot of effort in uh, keeping it running, like uh, keeping the grid up. Like uh, we have this, uh, this uh, loop that just to look for commits and then it runs, it runs, it runs, it runs. And then every now and then you have to go check. Did it find something? Okay, nothing, keep running. So uh, you seem to be like looking for this tool to be able to run on, on different cloud provider. But you, you, if I read between the lines, it's sort of like you write the tool, other people run it. Do I get it wrong? Sorry, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Just trying to understand. Uh, well, how, how you use the tool um, is up to you. Um, in my case, I'll, I obviously will be using it to test uh, file systems, right? Uh, you may want to use, uh, I can't say how you want to use KDevOps, right? Um, the the technology and, and the, the what is being provided here is an easy way for you to do ramp up and how you use it is up to you. Now, of course, I have my own ways in which I plan on in integrating this and I am doing my own integration and, and using it, but uh, I cannot say, I can't dictate uh, how you should be using it, given that this is intended by design to be flexible. Um, I think that how you use it, that's really a separate aspect to this. Um, and it's certainly worth discussing. However, it is a separate effort how, you, for instance, you may use it to do continuous integration, for instance. Uh, that itself is a separate topic, though, and worth talking for sure. But it definitely is a separate uh, goal and objective. Andreas is typing. It really depends. Um, if you're a customer, for instance, and you want to reproduce a, uh, a bug uh, and you want to contribute to upstream FS tests with it, sure, you, you would use it. If you're a customer, for instance, and you want to see what it's like to, um, to run tests for FOSS systems, you can certainly use KDOPS to try to create in an easy way a uh, testing framework and to try to run tests. Um, getting someone who's not familiar to actually run FS tests uh, can be quite complex. Uh, the, the goal behind this project really is to try to reduce the amount of time it takes to run your tests and also to do the bring up, right? 
Um, so it's really up to the customer. If they see value in it, they can certainly do it, do so. Um, from our perspective, without going too much into the private details, uh, we obviously will be using and do use it for our own development and our own testing. But um, it's it's up to those who find the tool useful to use it or not. Um, and there's no reason to shove this down anyone's throat, right? It's all it is is just a framework uh, with uh, technologies put together to allow you to easily do bring up and run a workflow. Now. Uh, as indicated earlier uh, in talking, uh, uh, addressing Giovanni's point, how we actually use it, that is a separate, separate effort. Any other questions? Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. So thank you, Luis, for this talk. Sure. And I think we can close the session.